Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America in Union City, Tennessee. This episode is brought to you by West Tan Insurance Group, one of the oldest independent insurance agencies in the state of Tennessee. Thank you, Emily. Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home in West Tennessee. I'm your host, Scott Williams. Um, Emily, before I introduce today's fascinating guest, what is something you have discovered this week at Discovery Park of America? As I was doing some research for social media posts, I learned a little bit about Slingshot Charlie Taylor, who uh, was an Obine County native and was famous for his prowess with a slingshot, and he used it at the Real Foot Lake where he worked as a guide. Yeah, his whole story is fascinating to me. There's also a photograph in our um, in our uh, gallery there where his uh, slingshot is that is from some kind of an outdoors conference that took place in Chicago, and he's in the very middle of it. And there's literally a thousand people around him of all different, you know, all different types of hunters, and there's hunting dogs. And anyway, it's uh, really, he's got a really interesting story. So thank you for sharing that with us. Um, so my guest today, I cannot wait to talk to, Jonathan Lodge is a hunter, a conservationist, an amateur mycologist, and the co-owner of Perry Logic Brewing Brewing Company in Paris, Tennessee. Man, that's hard. That's a mouthful. Um, <laughs> and, he, and he goes by John. So welcome, John. Hey, man. Good to, good to see you. Good. And thanks for having me. Hey, yeah. I mean, we've got a lot of stuff we're going to talk about. So first of all, let's start from the very beginning. Sure. Uh, tell us a little bit about where you grew up and what your childhood was like. Well, man, uh, to make it easy, uh, my, my father is a minister and, and we moved to uh, West Tennessee to Paris uh, when I was about five years old. And fortunately for me, we never went anywhere else. And, and growing up, I always thought I'd, I'd go uh, literally anywhere but here. And uh, I've traveled the world and I wouldn't want to raise my family anywhere else. I've got uh, four beautiful children um, and a beautiful wife. And we've got a little hobby farm uh, that we live on, little 50 acres. Uh, my wife's a professional artist and um, I co-own a brewery with my business partner, Randall Perry. So um, you, how old were you when you moved to West Tennessee? I was five. I was five. I just started kindergarten. So I've, I'm, don't hold that against me, uh, you know, that I wasn't uh, born here, uh, but I am definitely, uh, definitely native now. <laughs> and what uh, denomination was your dad a pastor? Presbyterian. Okay, yep. great. He's a Presbyterian minister and he just actually just retired after like 36 years or something. Did he stay yeah. there in Paris? At the, at uh, the he's, he's, he's moved to around in West Tennessee, but yeah. That's great. Uh, so you were growing up in Paris. You mentioned you traveled around the world. What what got you to other places other than Paris? Uh, you know, I, I just, I wanted, I've always been curious. I've always been curious about the world around me. Um, that's, that's my team, so to speak. Uh, that's, that, that's kind of how I structure my life. I, I want to learn as much as I can. And, and I realize the more you learn about the world around you, the less you know anything. <laughs> it's kind of a catch-22. You just, uh, there, uh, there's not a day that goes by that I just, I, you know, wow, I had no idea this was like this. So um, I just wanted to explore and, and see the world. And, and I've been to oh, a few dozen countries and pretty much every state. And uh, yeah, so, but I, I love, I love West Tennessee. It's so diverse um, and culturally, uh, and uh, biologically, I just I find it a fascinating place to, to be. Uh, there's just so much that people don't understand is just indicative to this region, just to this area. Um, and my, mycology, my study of mycology has kind of helped me figure a lot of that out um, as far as the uniqueness uh, of, of this area. What was the first place that you visited as a young person outside of the United States? Oh man. Um, 
we went to my my family and I. We went uh, to Europe and we did like a European. Um, you know, we went to London and Paris and Germany and Switzerland and, and all that. And uh, we were gone for a few weeks. Um, and I mean, the world is is you know the the cliche. It's it's once you get out there, it's it's a lot smaller than you think. Uh, you know. Uh, people are, are the same, no matter where you go. Um, and it's funny cause we actually ran into some people from Paris at the, uh, at the London museum. So <laughs> that we knew and had dinner with that night that we had no idea we we're going to be there. So <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's, that's funny. I've actually done that too. Like been out of the country and run into somebody from West Tennessee. Yes. You know, and it's kind of mind blowing when you're, it's walking very around. mind blowing. Yeah, I mean, it's it's happened on more than one occasion for me when I've been out of the country and I've ran into somebody that I've known. So that's, that's yeah. But I, I don't get to travel as much as I'd like anymore because of the business um, and because of children. And but so I, I, my advice to young 20-something-year-olds, if you can, instead of spending money on cars or anything down, go, go travel. Yeah, 100% agree. Um, your, uh, how, so you traveled, when was your first time you went solo, uh, by yourself or with friends? I was 18. We backpacked for about six weeks. Um, we went all through Europe. We had a year rail pass. Um, it was my high school graduation gift. You know, everyone else got a car, got a scholarship, something like that. And I wanted to go backpack. And so, uh, we, we backpacked for about six weeks and, uh, it was life changing. And you had no adults or anyone there standing over you and it's, you know, midnight in Paris and you're trying to catch a train back to your hostel and you're just like, oh man, you know, it's, you learn a lot. You learn a lot about yourself and about people, you know? <laughs> yeah. There's nothing like international travel. You know, Discovery Park was in a lot of ways built, you know, Robert Kirkland was big on travel and exposing people to ideas and places and things that, that were, would be inspirational and life-changing. So it sounds like you're, you're doing that. Uh, you've been doing that your whole life. Yes. Yes. I, like I said, curiosity is, is, is what drives me. And what's fascinating to me is a, as I've uh, become an adult, I've, I've realized that there's so much to learn culturally about the place that I'm living that I had no idea. There's so much history um, right here in West Tennessee that you just, you don't even realize. I mean, um, three days ago, I was on the phone in my front yard and picked up a, a, a Dina Adina point from the Adina culture out of the Ohio Valley. I was just sitting in my front yard, uh, probably, you know, 8,000 years old, just, just right there. And I'm like, what in the heck? You know, you just have no idea the multi layers of experience that exists, you know, beneath our feet uh, and with the people that are still living that are bridging generational gaps that you can learn so much from. Well, the first step is being able to recognize one of those when you come across it. So a lot of people would pick it up and throw it into the woods. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. This wasn't a whole point, but it was definitely, uh, definitely it was a, a, a Dina point. So which you identify by the base, but I've, I've always just been fascinated with the idea of, of find like seeking, you know, so seeking knowledge. So foraging came, it became such a natural part of, of my, my life because I've always been a hunter. I've always been a trapper. I've always been a fisherman. I've always been a steward of the land. Um, but, you know, uh, hunting and trapping and fishing are hard. So you kind of come up empty handed. And, and so when you integrate foraging into that, uh, you know, you lessen your chances of coming home skunks. So you might find a big bag of chanterelle mushrooms or you might find some, you know, shiso ready for the table or any number of things. So, so let's back up a little bit. Was your father a hunter as well? Did he take you hunting or is that something no. you came up with on your own? Yeah, that was definitely something I came up with on my own. He, he's been very supportive. Uh, and my mother has, and, uh, but no, it was one of those things, you know, growing up, it was just go outside and play. And, um, I, you know, I'd get bored, didn't have too many friends on my street, you know, maybe a couple, but you know, it wasn't, I just, I wanted to be outside. So, uh, you know, you, you kind of find things to do. And, and I had, um, I'll never forget it, the, the, the life-changing books, which I still have, even though they're full of crayons right now from the four kids that I've raised, uh, I, were the Audubon series. 
So having the Audubon Field Guide series, um, I can't even remember how I got started or who got me the first one, but I still have every single one uh, since I was a kid and I still use them. Um, so it was kind of neat. I really got into herpetology as a, as a kid. And so that was kind of what I was foraging or seeking or hunting for a while was I, I, I would, I would bring home, a, you know, 150 pound, uh, alligator snapping turtle in a, in a red wagon, a radio flyer. And, uh, yeah, just all sorts of wild, you know, I bring home giant, uh, you know, cottonmouth snakes or just, you know, it was my, my poor mother and father, you know, they, they didn't really know what to do when I'd come home with some of these things, you know, and, and, uh, but it was just, I was always studying, I was always researching and I was always, you know, I've learned the Latin names and I've learned the families and I've learned everything that I could about these things. And I just, I was always fascinated by you know, what's an amphiuma? I have no idea. I've never seen this. And so now then I'd have to go and find the, the the place where they live and I'd have to maybe set a trap or dredge it or something like that to try to even catch one or see one. And so, I mean, that has always been um, a part of me, uh, loving animals. I've always had animals as pets. I've always rehabilitated animals. Um, so, and we still do. We still rehabilitate animals. Um which just where we live, we'll occasionally find a baby squirrel or some baby possums was this summer. And, and we try to raise them and, and release them back into the wild as best we can. And, and, and it's, it's a neat experience for the, for the kids because it's not always easy and it doesn't always work. Sometimes they die and these are important life lessons, you know? <laughs> now, what are the ages of your kids now? Uh, I've got two, five, seven, and eight. Wow. So, so you're busy. We're busy. <laughs> have you taken them uh, because of COVID? You haven't probably gotten to travel as much. Have they been out of the country yet? No, no, they, they haven't. Um, you know, yeah, the, the whole, the whole COVID thing, we've, we've just tried to uh, try to be safe, buckle down and we spent a lot of time outdoors. You know, vitamin, vitamin D is really good for you. We, we when they get together with friends, we try to be outside as much as possible. Um, you know, um, but, but the bounty of, of nature, it, it offers so much more than any TV show or internet or video games. And I'm, I'm not opposed to any of that stuff, but you know, there's, there's just something to seeing your, your child for the first time shoot a squirrel or, or, or catch a fish or a frog or any number of things, you know? So my, 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 my son in particular, he's kind of, uh, carried the torch and he'll bring home giant bullfrogs and musk turtles and all sorts of stuff. So, yeah. Now, did you, so in high school, I'm sure you did great in biology and pursued yeah. those type of interests. When it came time post high school, did you uh, know which direction you wanted to head uh, career wise? You know, I, for whatever dumb reason, I studied philosophy. Um, I love philosophy. Um, that's uh, went to Murray State, um, great school. Uh, you know, it's given me a lot of tools for life for me to be able to um, communicate better, uh, problem solve, critical thinking, these these type of things. Um, but you know, as of now, I, I mop floors and wash dishes for a living. I mean, that's what I tell people I do as a brewery owner. I mean, that's, you know, do a lot of taxes and take out clean toilets and take out the garbage. So that's kind of the, the, the vanity of, of, of a brewery owner. Um, that's but, the hospitality business in general. Ab absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so uh, where, where did you, so you majored in philosophy, by the way, my daughter just graduated with a degree in philosophy. So hopefully she's um, going to be a lawyer, you know, right? yeah, yeah, we'll see. She's okay. trying to decide. Uh, yeah. She likes, she likes social work too. She's, she's awesome. a helper. So, so yeah. Cool. Yeah. There's not too many uh, classified ads, you know, wanted philosopher, you know? <laughs> right. But we, we have a great time uh, talking about big issues of the day. So yeah, sure. Good. Um, so you, what was your, what was your first job out of college? Man, I have worked since I was a kid. I mean, I've, I've, I've had, I've, I've worked my entire life. Um, I've worked a lot of the hospitality, uh, industry, um, mostly restaurants. Um, and then when I got out, believe it or not, um, I got 
my, my real my first real job was in debt collection and, and management and um it was in jackson tennessee and i, I enjoyed that uh and then um we 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 came back here to be closer to family my wife and i and i and i took over haphazardly took over a music store which i loved managed that for several years until i opened uh, perry london with randall so so you and Randall Perry were, were buddies, I'm assuming? Yeah, yeah. I was actually teaching him guitar lessons at the music store, so yeah. Okay, so, and you guys are, are uh, were you already making beer as a hobby? Well, I've just, I've always been a foodie. I've, I've always loved food and cooking, and, I, I, you know, I'd get into cheese making or get into any number, you know, baking or any of the technical, you know, pastry or whatever, and, and um, my wife got me a, or my mother-in-law actually got me a beer making kit for, for Christmas uh, one year. And I, and I was like, man, this is awesome. I'm, I love beer. I'm going to make some beer. And I, and I made a batch and it was awful, absolutely terrible. And so, uh, so then I, then I got frustrated and I said, okay, let me do some reading and do some research. So I, I did what I always do. And, and then it was awful again, my second time. So after that, I, I, I said, let's give him Randall a guitar lesson. I said, Hey man, I know you make wine. You ever made beer? And he said, yeah, I've made beer a few times. I said, man, I've made it twice, you know, and you wait 30 days. And then the, after 30 days, it was just terrible. Could, could you maybe help me out? And uh, we just loved it so much. We got together and, and started brewing and it became a weekly thing. And we were brewing all the time and giving beer away. And it was just a natural progression towards, man, a lot of people love this product. Let's, uh, let's, let's do it for a living. So and for people was, who for people who aren't who get their beer out of the refrigerator case, um, right. what exactly is you know you guys were brewing on the weekends? What what does that entail? <laughs> well, it, it involves making your wives very angry because you're <laughs> you're stinking up the house and making a mess. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, essentially, they have these dehydrated sugars. Uh, is essentially what it is, and and they're they're. You, you pre they're kind of pre-mixed and you then add your 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 fungus your yeast and uh and then you sit and you, you let it bubble away in a corner and, and then you kind of bottle it up just try to clean bottles out and it's 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 a lot different than the commercial process um but the actual um the actual ideas behind it are the same we've the, we've been brewing the same way for twelve thousand years so um it's the same methodology, essentially, um, that has is unchanging. So it's just, you know, sugary water that you ferment. Um, and, and you ferment that with, uh, with yeast, um, which is a type of fungus. And um, so now, obviously, I have, we have a lot more equipment now to be able to do that, uh, to, to have it consistent and, and so forth. And lots of, lots of that type of, you know. So somewhere along the way, you guys decided to make the leap from just weekend amateur, you know, to, right. to professional brewery. What yeah. what went into that that thinking? Oh my goodness, man! It was, you know, the it was exciting. Obviously, the thought of it was very exciting. Um, the you, you, with any new business venture, you try to project pitfalls and. And, and issues that you might have and successes and, you know, the, the, these type of things. But I, I can safely say, I can speak for, for both of us, that we face some things that we just weren't prepared for um, that were just absolutely overwhelming that we had to overcome. Uh, like we, for instance, we had ordered some equipment from overseas and it got caught in the longshoreman strike that you probably don't even remember that no one else does. But it was everything to us because we sat and watched our equipment circle on the ocean. Um, so you know, we had to learn three phase power um, to bring to. I'm curious, what was your what was your when you started? What was your vision? Um, you know, I wanted to initially. I wanted to bring uh, bring a brewery to downtown Paris. Um, Unfortunately, uh, that didn't that didn't work out. Maybe in the future it will be facilitated. Um, but you know, we just wanted to bring um, a great product, something we were proud of, something that we could get behind, something that we could say this is ours, um, and kind of introduce 
people in West Tennessee to craft beer. At the time, there wasn't that many breweries in the state. In fact, we actually had to get a state law changed so that we could even open up, which meant we were petitioning our, our local um, representative at the time, Tim Morgo, and uh, several other uh, people that were involved in the legislative process to, to be able to get this law changed just so that we could open. So that was a another, another hurdle that you just had no idea you would have to go through. And you're nervously waiting to see if the governor will sign it. And, I mean, it was, yeah. So as far as our vision, you know, we, we've always been very fluid. I think that's, to, if you're going to be successful in business, you kind of have to do an about face when you realize something isn't working out. So we've, we've always kind of um, adeptly changed our business model to fit the needs of the business, so to speak. And we listen to our customers. That's a big, big thing. So try to listen to our customers and, and try to give them, listen to feedback and give them what they want. Um, you know, when COVID hit and we got shut down, we, we started canning so that we could get, uh, we could get product to off premise sites, you know, gas stations and whatnot. I mean, just things like that. Right now we're expanding our kitchen because it's a need. So um, that's just, it's, it's evolved. We, we've, we're constantly buying new equipment and, and trying to get better at what we're doing. It's, you're never done. You've never, you, you've never said, okay, this is where it's supposed to be. This is, this is it. You know, you, you, there is no end when, when you're offering something like this, you, you, you work hard for, for the people that want it. So let's quickly uh, talk about your logo. Cause I understand it was done by a very special graphic designer. Yes. Yes. My wife does all of our artwork. Um, when, when we first started, she was working a regular nine to five job and she'd always been artistic went to school for art. And, um, she started designing our logo and started getting confidence when she, you know, you'd see t-shirts in Nashville or wherever that she designed from people that we didn't know. And that, I mean, that's just kind of cool. So she's done all of our artwork for all of our, you know, labels and everything like that. And um, so since that, she, she started her journey to become a professional artist. And she's very, very successful. Does mostly commission work, and um, she's working hard right now. So, <laughs> so what's the symbolism behind your logo? Well, um, she, we want, we've always, you know, because of our mutual love for for nature. Um, she wanted, uh, Randall and I wanted to do kind of, you know, focus on nature and, and things like that. And, and so she asked us, what, you know, what's your favorite animal of West Tennessee? And, and Randall said, the red wolf. And, and I said, uh, the bald eagle. So she, she did that in the shape of an acorn, you know, because we have a lot of oaks and old growth oak forest here. And, and uh, it's, it's been that way ever since. <laughs> Excellent. So you guys, do you have, do you have a physical place people can go to? Yeah. Tell us about so that. We have a, yeah. So we have a tap room and it's, um, it's open Tuesday through Saturday, um, four to eight. Uh, we, it's, it's open for families. Um, there, you know, there's no smoking or riffraff or anything like that. It's not a bar. Um, there's of course other drinks besides beer. Um, we offer food. It's, it's food that we, it's, we don't offer a whole lot of selection, but the selection we do, we just try to nail it. So we're known for our burgers. We have the local butcher shop grind uh, whole sirloin and briskets to, to make our burger patties fresh every week. Um, and then we smoke them and then we hit them on a grill and, uh, and then you dress them up however you want. And uh, I mean, people come, People come just for the burgers. So, and then we offer weekly specials that change and we try to do everything that we possibly can in house. That's important. We try to just do it authentic and, and just like our beer, you know, we're not buying anything frozen. We don't have microwaves or anything like that, you know? So we, we try to take a lot of pride in any product that we're putting out. So for and folks, it makes a difference for folks <laughs> who are uh, coming to visit discovery park of America and they've never been to Paris. Can you describe Paris a little bit for listeners who maybe think Paris is the place in France with the Eiffel tower? Uh, it's like, uh, it's like the place in France, uh, and Mayberry <laughs> if combined. <laughs> uh, it's a, it's a great community, man. We, we, uh, we take care of ourselves. I mean, we, we try to help each other out. We have, 
tons of charitable programs that are, are just help out our community and help out other communities. Um, everyone here is just amazing. Um, the town is, is not too big. It's not too small. You know, you're two hours from Nashville, two and a half from Memphis, four from St. Louis. I mean, you're just you're an hour from Paducah, an hour from Jackson. You can get to the big city, but then you can come back here and enjoy the splendor of the Kentucky Lake area, which is a big part of, of, of our community. Um, and we, you know, we have a, a wonderful wildlife reserves and, and land between the lakes is 20 minutes, you know, just down the road, which is an amazing uh, national recreation area uh, that I spend a lot of time in myself. Um, so Paris just offers a, a, a bounty of natural resources and just a great community. Um, it's very united. And it's less than an hour from Discovery Park of America. That's right. It makes a great, That's right. a great trip. Uh, I, I have not been uh, to your tap room, so I just added it to my list of must-dos uh, this this fall. So we're going to take a quick break, and when we get back, I'm going to ask you about mushrooms. Awesome. West Hand Insurance Group offers the best insurance products with exceptional customer service. They specialize in coverage for business, bonds, life and health, home, autos and ATVs, boats, motorcycles, and more. With over 30 companies to choose from, they can easily find the right product for you, your business, and family. To find a West Hand insurance agent closest to you, call 1-800-467-5453 or visit www.westhandinsurance.com. I hope you're enjoying Real Foot Forward podcast from Discovery Park of America. If you are, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a positive review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. This is your host, Scott Williams, and our guest today is John Lodge. He's a hunter, conservationist, amateur mycologist, and co-owner of Perry Logic Brewing Company in Paris, Tennessee. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in uh, mushrooms uh, for people who didn't know. Mycology, I guess, is the study of uh, mushrooms. Uh, what, what got you interested in that? Well, I, I've, so we, we live in a, a, a mycophobic culture in West Tennessee. So meaning... Uh, most of us are, are pretty scared of mushrooms. So, um, you know, don't pick it up. It's poisonous. It'll kill you. You can never know the difference. You know, you can never know the difference between a poisonous mushroom. Even the experts you can never know. You know, I heard that um, from, from people growing up. And, uh, I, you know, just like any other knowledge, it's, it's not beyond the, the realm of learning and understanding and I got into it initially because I had a waste issue at the brewery. I, I was disposing of my um, my spent brewer's grain. So after we'd gone through the process of extracting the sugar, we had leftover grain holes that would spoil rather quickly. Um, you know, you're, you're you're technically not supposed to feed them to livestock, and and so we just had an issue. We might have you know several hundred pounds of this stuff as to what to do and how to properly dispose of it. So I started researching and, and finding out that, uh, you know, some people would use them to grow mushrooms. And I, and I thought, man, that is just, I'd never even dreamed you could even grow mushrooms. And so I started researching and, uh, man, it has been a wild ride since then. I have, uh, there's not a day goes by that I don't, I'm not reading or trying to sharpen my sword, so to speak, when it comes to mycology, because I'm constantly baffled. It's, it's definitely in the realm of, you can never understand or know everything there is to know. It's so complicated. I mean, you, you, you yourself are composed of multiple, multiple millions of funguses that are, are in our bodies. Um, we, you know, everything from Coca-Cola to batteries. Um, I mean, it's just, it's inescapable. It's not just the fermented foods that you think about, but it's also coffee, which is fermented and chocolate, which is fermented. All of these things we wouldn't have without mushrooms. Um, and we're learning with soil science that, um, that the healthiest soil science has, you know, a, a good microbiome of, of different funguses. And, uh, you know, if you're, if you're growing an old growth forest, uh, 
the only reason why those trees have gotten as old as they have is because they have a mycorrhizal relationship with, with a fungus species or two or three or four. So, and, um, and it's, and it's fascinating how this world works. It's, it's, we're, we're more related to the fungus, to the fungi kingdom than we are to the plant kingdom, but it is absolutely alien. It's, 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 it's unreal how, how this kingdom, this, this biological kingdom functions. And, um, so I'm, I'm always learning and I'm always trying to educate people safely obviously to to learn and expand their knowledge i have certain rules that i live by that i tell everyone when it comes to mushrooms and mushroom hunting um you know number one is if you're 99.9 percent sure you just need to leave it in the woods you you've got to be a hundred percent there's there's no guessing here because there are some that can kill you just like plants just like animals i mean if you if you go and shoot a long nose guard and, and take the eggs and decide you're going to have some redneck caviar. Well, it, you're going to die. It, it will kill you. The eggs of a gar will kill you. Um, so if you take mullion, you know, and, and decide you're going to make a, a tea out of it and you're using the, the, the seeds that will kill you. So there's, there's, I mean, like I said, we live in a, a mycophobic uh, culture. I, I think I suspect the reason being is because this area was, specifically hit rather hard by the great depression so coming out of the great depression with the new deal and with world war ii um it was you know kind of looked down upon to to eat the weeds so to speak to to do what the old timers were doing and so a lot of that tradition was unfortunately lost um but there is you know accounts historical accounts for trappers and 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 uh, meat market hunters and and explorers you know utilizing you know the ozark trail famously they had giant puffballs saved a bunch of them while they were going through the plains one time and they ground them up and made flour I mean, so you know there is a tradition there is a culture um you know and if you go to different areas of the united states they, they become um uh, more mycophilic they they are, are you know there's mushroom festivals in michigan and things like that but here in the South, it's it's been kind of an uphill battle in, in West Tennessee for me to preach the, the good news of fungus. But it's some of the best things you can do for your body is is, um, is utilize these these gifts that have been given um, biologically uh, in the form of funguses. So you'll see a lot of supplements now in Walmart or wherever that contain fungus or contain this lion's mane or reishi or cordyceps or any of these number of things. And they, they do work. They're they're clinically proven to work and they're used to treat all sorts of ailments, everything from PTSD to cancer patients to, I mean, they, they, you know, you have to understand that our antibiotics all come from funguses, you know, all, most of our medication comes from some sort of fungus or it's made in a lab with fungus. So it's an integral part of our life. It's, it's inescapable. You would be dead without it, you know, so are there uh, um, mushrooms that grow more naturally in specifically in West Tennessee that are a little more rare that you wouldn't find elsewhere? Yeah, there's there's a uh, there's some interesting there's some interesting mushrooms around here that are uh, indicative to the area. The thing about fungus is, you know, it's spread by spores. They're microscopic. Um, they're they're really good at, at traveling long distances. So, you know, a lot of the mushrooms that we have here, like for instance, chanterelles, we're just getting out of chanterelle season. Um, there's eight to 10 species of chanterelles in, in West Tennessee. And I, and I say that because genetically there, there's some issues uh, in identification as to whether this is the same species or not. So we'll just, you know, assume it's around a dozen, but, you know, for instance, um, the golden chanterelle, uh, there's festivals and, uh, um, various Asian countries for, for the same exact mushroom. So it's, it's, it's rather fascinating when you look at old world to new world mushrooms. Um, there's a few examples that are, are kind of, to me, just mind blowing. Uh, for instance, you've every, everyone that's ever had an apple tree is, is familiar with apple rust rot. And so that's the little red dots that get on your apple leaves and they prevent, you know, um, photosynthesis from occurring and, it, and the leaves fall off and it eventually kills your tree. Well, the other half of that mushroom is, is found in um, 
the eastern red cedar or Americanus juniperus, uh, which is indicative to the uh, New World. And so for that mushroom to properly um, reproduce, it has gone from that Americanus juniperus to a old world tree, you know, out of Kazakhstan is where is where apples originated. I, I just find that mind blowing that in this short frame, this this 500 year of the Columbian exchange, you know, we already have mushrooms that are, have adapted to, you know, new species and are able to propagate, you know, in that fashion. I mean, that's just so, so cool to me. So if somebody wanted to learn more about mushrooms and they live in West Tennessee, where are there mushroom courses or, you know, how does one find out more? <laughs> I, I've taught several mushroom courses. Um, I've got a few coming up. Um, uh, we have the uh, uh, Tennessee um, Wildlife. I cannot remember the full name, but the Tennessee Wildlife. Um, it's I'm drawing a blank. You know and, we have and, and the this. we have the uh, Tennessee Naturalist program that we uh, for West Tennessee that we run out of Discovery Park of America. Oh, cool. um, you know, so maybe we uh, we need to get you plugged in here at some point, or maybe for members, Discovery Park members. I would love to have a program here. Um, where you come and teach the introduction to, to yes, I love it. I, I like to uh, I like to kind of do a hands on. I'll, I'll bring several examples. Some um, you know, I'll, if, if depending on the environment, I might bring some to, to actually try or, or or just what things look like, and or you know, we might go out and forage. I've done several of those. Um, I've offered private foraging lessons. Um, I've, I've People have asked, especially over COVID, they didn't want big crowds. So people have asked me to do that for them. And I said, yeah, sure. You know, let's, let's go out in the woods and tromp around and get some seed ticks and see what we can find. And, uh, you know, the, the <coughs> excuse me, the, the, the major thing to do is, is to, to read. We have all of human knowledge at our fingertips for the first time in history. And uh, I don't, I don't think we're, we're utilizing these tools like we we probably should. Uh, it's in our pocket, man. You you can you can read, you can learn anything. Um, you can learn how to open a brewery. You can learn about mushrooms. You can learn, you know, uh, whatever you want. So I I do a lot of reading. There's a lot of great websites dedicated to foragers to keep foragers safe. Of course, with social media, there's some great communities you can join. That this is all people like me do. Um, I get text messages, you know, from people every single day. I don't even know the numbers, just what is this, you know, and then it'll be a picture of a mushroom. So, I mean, just like I said at the beginning of this, the, the, the main thing is be curious, be curious about the world around you and, and, and get, get, go down, go down the rabbit holes, you know, click the hyperlinks on Wikipedia and to, until you learn something that's, you know, um, so you learn something new. So I'm, I'm every time I go out into the woods, I find something that I have no idea what it is and I bring it back home. And I, and I, it's not just mushrooms, but you know, I, I try to identify what it is, try to learn about it, try to, try to understand it. And, uh, if you live your life that way, it, it's very fulfilling, you know? So, so teaching, you know, you love to share what you've learned, obviously, and you're kind of a living embodiment of our mission at discovery park. So, um, are you, using any of those uh, social networks to share your, are you on TikTok or YouTube or, you know? Um, yeah, I, I probably should be better at this. Uh, I'm really bad with technology. Uh, we, we, we live in a place where we don't have access to internet um, and, and we don't do the, the, you know, TV or anything like that. So I'm, I'm, I'm terrible at it, but I, you know, I do have an Instagram I post a lot of mushroom stuff on that's lodge.jonathan. Um, and you know, I, I should do more, I should do more on social media, but I, I really enjoy like we're doing right now, just the, the conversationalist, the one-on-one, -on -one. if you come up to my tap room and I'm bartending and you ask me about mushrooms, you better not have anything to do because that's what we're going to talk about. And cause I just, you know, uh, or foraging or, or any, any of these things, uh, you know, anything to do with outside. I'm, I'm always fascinated. I'm always trying to learn. Um, I've been recently, 
pretty involved in, in learning about chronic waste disease that's that's just got into Henry County that's been going through West Tennessee. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of great scientific articles on NIH.gov that you peer reviewed that you can read and, and they take a while. They are scientific, you know, scientific journals are hard to understand. They're hard to read. Um, but my yeah, for, recommendation for, for someone who doesn't know what that is, why don't you explain what chronic waste disease is? Chronic wasting disease is a, um, it's a disease that is caused by uh, prions. Prions are a type of misfolded protein. They were discovered in the 20th century. Um, there's no knowledge of them existing prior to the 20th century. Um, they're, they're somehow or another have been man-made. We don't really understand how, but we, uh, we have affected their, them into existence. Essentially, it's a terrifying disease because you can't cook it out of your meat. You can't um, you can't disinfect it. Um, it's not a living cell like a virus or a bacteria or something like that. Um, so, you know, a lot of people he hearing someone like me talk about CWD, they, they kind of just shrug their shoulders and say, well, I won't deer hunt anymore. It's not going to affect me or, or I'm not a deer hunter. It's not going to affect me. Well, these prions, they stay in the water supply for decades. Um, they just, they, they're, they're forever chemicals, so to speak. They, once they, once they're enter into you, you're going to have them forever. They're just, they're dangerous. Mad cow disease is, is probably the most famous of the pregenic diseases. Um, but you know, it's something that as a community, we, we really have to do sound conservation techniques to be able to prevent the spread of it. But and I'm a deer hunter and I love deer hunters, but deer hunters are hard headed and to get deer hunters to do what deer hunters need to do in the next few years is really an uphill battle. And, uh, um, there's some successful instances of eradicating CWD famously Norway in the seventies, um, had a great program where they actually eradicated it completely from their country. Uh, we could, we could really lessen its effects here in the United States, but, you know, we've got to stop feeding deer. We've got to stop piling corn up. We've got to stop having salt licks. We've got to stop having these communal areas where deer saliva can be transferred. If you want to feed deer, plant a plot. You know, the likelihood of, of deer, you know, eating the same plate of grass is, is a lot slimmer than them standing over a pile of corn. You and I both have a passion for West Tennessee. Uh, you mentioned it earlier that there were things about West Tennessee that you felt like were unique to the whole rest of the world. What are some of those things for, for folks who maybe haven't even ever been to West Tennessee? Well, I mean, just down the road from the brewery, there's something called a histosol, which is a rare type of soil. Um, and it was actually discovered uh, by a team, a, a friend of mine, um, that it's very unique, very rare um, to exist in the world. Um, I don't know all of the science behind it, uh, but there is a, so I'm not going to speak too far on it, uh, but there is a, you know, a plaque just down the road and, and talks all about it. And there's, you know, uh, Dover Flint is another one. Dover Flint was mined by Paleolithic Indians, uh, Native Americans, and it's been traded and found out west, found in Maine, found in Florida. It's a very particular type of flint that was, I guess, great for making sharp stone tools. Um, so there's just, there's a lot of those type of things that, uh, I don't know, people are, are kind of unaware of. I'll tell you a neat little mushroom, uh, neat little mushroom story. So um, the uh, Amanita caesarea, Amanita caesarea is a mushroom that is found in the old world. Um, Amanitas are some of the most toxic mushrooms uh, known on the planet. And um, uh, so the destroying angel, death cat, these are all uh, Amanita species. Um, and these, these are the type of mushrooms that when you eat them, there's the, you go to the hospital and they're going to say, call a, call a preacher because there's nothing they can do. It's a hundred percent death. So it's, they're, they're pretty, they're pretty awful, but the Amanita caesarea uh, was an edible mushroom. It was reserved for uh, the elites, Roman elites. Um, so after, Oh, I can't remember the, the, 
I, I know it was Agrippa, she, it's Claudius, Agrippa poisoned Claudius with a bowl of mushrooms. And so the, the Roman, the Roman uh, culture became mycophobic and, and they kind of stopped eating these mushrooms, but they would, they're, they're, they're mycorrhizal. They grow in conjunction with certain trees um, and come out certain types of year and, and they would eat them. They would actually eat them raw, which I don't eat any mushrooms raw just because of other pathogens and things that could be on them. Um, but so when a mycologist from Canada started finding them in North America uh, in the 1800s, um, he realized that uh, morphologically they were a tad bit different from the European variety. So he named them after uh, the American Caesar, who at the time uh, was was Andrew Jackson. And so that that mushroom is Amanita Jacksoni from where where you get that name. Uh, so, I mean, that's just that's an interesting thing that that's just kind of indicative to this area. Um, you know, there's there's all sorts of little antidotes and, 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 and remedies, I guess, so to speak, that, that come out of West Tennessee in this the, the greater region. Um, that showcases our uniqueness. Um, Land Between the Lakes is absolutely one of the greatest natural resources that we have um, in in this area. Uh, if you've not been, I highly recommend that you go because the the rock formations and, and just the topography and how much the land changes on, on that north-south latitude is, is pretty, pretty incredible. And uh, there's then there's also after you get through on the water, you can go to the tap room and uh, that's and right. Have, have one of those burgers. <laughs> right. you, you've got yeah. me. Well, yeah, we're just 15 minutes yeah, away, ab- man. Absolutely, yeah, that's right. man. I'm, I'm ready now <laughs> to, to meet you over there for yeah, lunch. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so thank you so much for being uh, with us. This was so interesting. I really appreciate you taking the time to to join us. Of course. And anytime you'd like to have me come do a lecture or anything like that at discovery park. I'd be glad to do it. Um, I'll, I'll bring, I'll bring my whole plan down and uh, my kids and, and love discovery park. So we don't get there as much as we, we should. If, if, if they had it their way, we'd, we'd be there every other week. So. Excellent. Well, we will do that. And thank you to all of you listeners who've joined us today at discovery park of America. Our mission here is to inspire children and adults to see beyond to plan an experience here for you and your family, visit discoveryparkofamerica.com. <laughs>